Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. alaikum. Welcome to News Room. I'm your host, Umar Khalid. But today is the 4th of March, 2024. We begin a new week with lots of uh, stories to discuss with you and to decipher with you to understand different points of views on that. Our first uh, story today concerns India. As a country leading the world as far as the cases of rape are concerned. This, of course, in connection with the rape of uh, on the 1st of March, that is on Friday, of a Spanish woman on a motorbike with her partner in Jharkhand in India, where seven people in India raped her. This is not the first time that such an incident has happened. We have so many other incidents in the past also, uh, whether they be Indians or foreigners, uh, whose uh, rape has caused alarm not only within India, but also within the international circle. Add to this the way the minorities are being uh, handled or, uh, you know, uh, uh, are being treated by the Narendra Modi government, whether it be the Muslims in India or in, in, in the illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir, whether it be the Christians, whether it be the Dalits, whether it be the Sikhs. There is a continuity of policy as far as the Modi government is concerned vis-a-vis -vis the minorities in India. This is going to be our first story. The incidents of rape in India as well as the uh, attitude towards minorities by uh, the uh, BJP uh, government. This will be our highlighting, highlighted story today. Our second story, ladies and gentlemen, concerns day 150 of uh, the conflict, the war between uh, Israel and Palestine. The number of cases have uh, are increasing and continue to increase. 30,534 people have been butchered by Israel since the 7th of October, or more than 70,000 have been injured and the list continues to increase with every passing hour. There is a lot of talk of truce of ceasefire between the two uh, sides. This has been uh, said again by Kamala Harris while she was addressing a, a rally and w in which she uh, urged uh, Israel to uh, stop its barbarities and to move towards a ceasefire. They said uh, there is a lot of uh, confusion as to whether the ceasefire will actually happen or not. Also, Ramzan is around the corner, it's going to start from next week. So, uh, will uh, these atrocities, uh, their, these brutalities continue by the Israeli troops within the holy month of Ramadan is something that we will also see. Uh, there is a lot of uh, talk on, uh, on cessation of hostilities, on a two-state solution, on different international fora, but for the moment, Israel does not seem to budge from its stance. This and more will be discussed in our second segment. Then, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to discuss uh, South Korea that has taken action against the protesting doctors. Its government has said that it will take steps to suspend the medical licenses for around 7,000 trainee doctors who have walked off the job and ignored a back-to-work order. This has been said by a vice health minister today. Then we are going to talk about the World Obesity Day, ladies and gentlemen, that is being observed across the world. Since 2015, the World Obesity Day is being uh, observed across the world to highlight what uh, the causes of obesity are and what obesity uh, causes as far as different ailments, uh, psychological and physical, are concerned and what needs to be done. This year, the message is obesity in youth, young people catalyzing change. The role of the young people is paramount and this is what is being trying to be highlighted uh, this year on World Obesity Day. Finally, in the Tianshan Mountains of Kyrgyzstan, villagers have made an artificial glacier to provide water for their drought-hit farms and they are in this way harnessing nature to counteract climate change. Climate change is a reality, ladies and gentlemen, that has affected countries even such as Pakistan. Now, there is a report also that Pakistan might be facing a drought-like condition in 2025. So maybe this could be an option, just like Kyrgyzstan has done uh, in order to create these artificial glaciers. This is going to be our last story. Let's begin with our first and that concerns. Uh, India that has uh, topped the list as far as uh, rape is concerned. Not only that, it also is one of the leading countries when it comes to uh, maltreating its minorities. We've been joined by Dr. Farah Nas. She's a foreign affairs expert. Thank you very much, Dr. Farah, to have joined us. Dr. Farah, uh, Friday saw the gang rape of uh, a Spanish-Brazilian uh, woman. Not the first time uh, uh, a foreigner or a foreign woman has been raped or gang raped, but also brings to light brings to mind many past incidents like that, uh, you know, no, uh, like that of Kashmiris, like that of uh, other uh, women who have been uh, raped time and again without any, uh, you know, A, justification and B, justice being provided to them. With sexual violence that is uh, targeting women common in India and of course women in minority tribal communities also particularly at risk, what does that say about the safety of women, uh, foreigner or Indian in India? Thank you, Umar, for having me on your show. 
Uh, I think the, the answer to your question lies in your question itself, that there is no safety for women in India who uh, pretends that it is um, a country for everyone where women are also treated equally, but I, unfortunately there is no equal treatment to women. And uh, the way they were dealing with their own local women, like the minorities, the Dalai women, and uh, the Muslim women, they were molesting them, harassing them at uh, workplace, at education institutions, even on the, um, uh, the festivals that they celebrate. So now uh, the treatment with foreigners is also becoming an acceptable norm in India, which is not something probably going to bring fame to India, but in fact, it will bring shame to India. And uh, we have seen this is not the first time where foreigners are uh, harassed, where foreigners are molested on the basis of where they are. And uh, the rape of, of, of a woman by seven people in itself is, I think, too huge to handle for all the feminist scholars across the world. If it is happening in India, it will bring a big question mark on the Indian uh, ruler, rule of law and the law and order situation that what is actually happening there, where they are uh, openly uh, pretending that uh, India is a country where the foreigners are welcome and it's it's a country where they should feel safe and secure and they are giving a sort of representation of India that India is a country where everyone should feel safe and secure but unfortunately this is not the case. We have seen it recently in Diwali in the Color Festival where foreigners were harassed and they were abused uh, badly and now with this incident it, it just like put final nail on the coffin of India that it's not a country for women, it's not a country for minorities, it's not a country even for Hindus at all, it's only a country for Hindutva, where Hindutva, RSS and its people can live and do whatever they want to. Now, uh, coming back to the rape incident that happened, it's a very unfortunate incident and if it happens to anyone, if it's a foreigner or a local, it's not acceptable. And um, um, I think when we when we look into the nitty gritty of it, we could see that the law and order situation, the way the police dealt with it, it was very slow, and they were not realizing that who they are. And actually, by the time they realized they are foreigners, then they were speeding up to uh, bring some justice to it. But what sort of justice they have brought so far? It's been it's quite a few days. What have they done? They have only captured three people, and they are still looking for other people. What sort of message have they passed on to to the to the world community that this is how we're going to deal with that? And only then they raised uh, and and raised up towards their um, you know the justice system when the Brazilian and uh, the um, the other embassy they kind of came into force and they demanded justice for their own women and whatever happened to them. Not only the woman but the men as well. Even a man is not safe. And at times uh, in our societies particularly in South Asia, if a woman is alone, she's always blamed for that why she was there outside without a man. But this woman, unfortunately, she was with her own husband, her own partner. So if she was with a partner, at least she should be spared. But along with the partner, she has been raped by the seven partner people. Was, the partner was also subjected to violence, Dr. Farah. Now, Dr. Farah, the National Crime Records Bureau says that one woman, I mean, uh, is uh, raped every 18 minutes. Uh, more or less. They were giving the statistics of the year 2022. They also said that on average around 90 rape cases are reported every day in India. Local media, international media have talked a lot about this uh, rape of uh, the Spanish-Brazilian woman. But will this case also die down like uh, the case of uh, uh, transnational terrorism in the United States and Canada has also died down? I think India is also one of the uh, most favorite child of the United States and all the Western countries. So this issue will also go under the table because one thing there is an acceptability of uh, molesting women in India, the way they were uh, making them naked and, and hitting them and, and beating them. The, the world is also aware of those kind of situations as well. So this is something probably in that, I will not defend it, but this is something better than that because in that situation, they were torturing their own women. So if they can torture their own women, there is an acceptability to, to a foreigner wo woman in India as well, which is altogether bad in, in whatever ways, means and definitions. But will there be any justice? Uh, will this issue will be taken by the um, international system where there are foreign embassies involved, where there are foreign countries involved? I don't see anything coming towards India because one, in uh, uh, India is required by all these powerful states as the strongest ally and they want their strongest ally to be positioned 
very strongly and firmly. So to have their allies stronger in, in this part of the world, they will just go away and let go all the things that, that come on their way. If it's a rape case or if it's anything, they would just brush it, brush it under the carpet. That is true. Now, Dr. Farah, you know, you, it's a very important term that you use, acceptability of rape. This acceptability of rape is also done by the Western uh, friendly countries to India, but it's also more or less done within India itself. How can we not forget the Bilkis Bano rape case, gang rape case in 2002, Gujarat? The, those uh, convicts were left free in 2022, but they were being, uh, they recently told by the Supreme Court to be rearrested again. But when they were let free, there were you no know, garlands were given, uh, put uh, in their necks in their honor, and sweets were distributed. Then, uh, 2012, the uh, notorious gang rape and murder of the Indian uh, student Jyoti Singh, who was raped, assaulted, and then left dead by five men and a teenager in a bus in New Delhi. Incidents like these, uh, you know, are very rampant but we don't hear uh, much about them because not much is reported about them. Will this incident of this uh, Spanish-Brazilian woman's rape change things? I don't see anything will change in this context because the world is still like, from the world I mean, the, the Western countries in particular, they are more interested in uh, rape of a, a Ukrainian woman by the Russians. They are more interested in where their own tail lies but when it comes to um, rape of a uh, Kashmiri woman by an Indian soldier in Kashmir Valley, nobody talk about that. So this incident where this Brazilian uh, woman is involved, in, um, I think there will be a hue and cry for a few days where probably it will be flashed on the international media as well for a little bit of time, as I mentioned, because their own interests are supreme and above all. And when it comes to money making, when it comes to power mechanism, when it comes to international and global power dynamics, they want India to be there strong enough, standing tall on its feet. So they will defend India come what may. If such kind of incidents are coming towards it or if it can bring a change, no, I don't see any change coming towards uh, India in that context. India, probably they will tell them that to behave or you, know, you need to give protection to the foreigners over there. But what sort of protection they can provide? And there, there was, I was just listening to Indian media on, on this issue of, um, of this foreigner getting raped in India. And they were talking about the look, she traveled from uh, Bangladesh to Pakistan and from Pakistan to India. And, and, and nothing happened to her in Pakistan. And this is what happened to her in India. And I was like, as if they were waiting that some, something will happen to, this, to foreigners or to this woman in particular in Pakistan. And then they will be creating a scene out of that. But and unfortunately, they are still talking about why not, this kind of issue did not happen to her in Pakistan, why in India it's happening. But our media... I would say they are playing this this issue very sensibly. They are taking it very responsibly because this is an issue of a woman who's uh, not only, you know, she has been uh, raped and tortured, but she's em emotionally very driven with this. And I, everybody is watching uh, the way she is posting on the social media platforms like Instagram, where her husband and her partner, they both are talking about what happened to them in their own native language. Of course, we all have the, the translations for that, what they're talking about, the way they have been molested, the way they have been kicked, the way even the, the, the helmet was pushed on their on their heads when they were trying to um, to get away with that. So that I don't Dr. see... Dr. Farah, Dr. Farah. You know, uh, whatever public, uh, any uh, member of the public does in a country is reflective of the way the government is leading that country. Uh, I'd like to understand uh, the, uh, you know, the way the Narendra Modi government has been functioning since 2014 on, a, uh, it's towing a line to, uh, you know, create divides on the basis of religion and region. There is a growing discrimination, not only on incidents such as these, but also on minorities, especially uh, when it comes to Muslims. Look at the Muslims. There is hardly a representation of Muslims in the civil society, in the police, in the government jobs. Uh, the number of Muslim graduates is also declining, particularly in northern India. The only place where the Muslims are in majority is sadly in jails. Why is India working on such a divide? Look, it's in the best interest of India because they are trying to pressurize all those communities from where they are fearful of that they may stand against the RSS agenda. 
And honestly, I'm overseas at the moment, and, and the number of Indians that I'm meeting here, they all are irrespective of what background, what ideological beliefs they are following. They are Hindus, they are Christians, they are Muslims, there are other communities even. Everybody says that we feel insecure in our own country, and we feel like we are no more valid over there. You're talking about the numbers of Muslim students dropping down, the number of other minorities um, uh, dropping down in education institutions, but the Hindu Hindus themselves are not secure in terms of their education, in terms of the research that they are doing. Whatever they do, it has to get approval from the uh, the Modi government, and it has to get approval from the Hindutva. I've been listening to stories about the Ram Mandir incidents, the way it was taking place, and and then uh, the way they all the, the Hindus and, and and all these Zionist sort of mindset, the way they were coming up to all those people who were not following um, the Hinduism as their religion and they were demanding of them that you have to promote the Ram Mandir, uh, you know, promotion thing. So this is not acceptable. How can you impose your own ideology on, on, on other people and then you are demanding them that they should respect it the same way as you are respecting it because these are two different ideologies to follow. You can show respect towards each other's ideology but you cannot ask other people that come and, and believe in whatever I believe is the right thing to do so. So unfortunately Unfortunately, according to Hindutva, according to RSS, according to Modi, they are putting pressure on everyone to think the way they want them to think, to do the way they want them to do. That's the major reason people are trying to evacuate, people are trying to move out, and people are trying not to get education in those institutions where, they're, they, where they don't have the right, you know, to uh, con to conduct research the way they want to do. If it has to get approval, there is no point about such kind of researches. So that's the major reason. Another point, of of course, of uh, this uh, growing intolerance is also what is happening in Indian legally occupied Jammu and Kashmir. We see how the this Muslim majority area is slowly and steadily, through a wrongly created laws, uh, is being converted into a Muslim minority. Muslims are extremely worried about how this region is going to turn out to be, as well as other areas where the Muslims have uh, more or less of a say. What's your comment as far as this discrimination, this intolerance towards uh, uh, religious minorities, especially Muslims, is concerned? And with respect to Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir? Look, uh, we can see from where it is all coming. It's all coming from the Modi uh, political campaigning. And he is always banking on this Muslim card whenever he's going to, ca to, to attract voters and to get their attention and to get re-elected in the uh, major elections. So he is playing the Muslim card very well. And he is making promises that if I get into power, see what will I do. And he also stands on his promises as well. He's not unlike other leaders who who are not fulfilling their promises. He fulfilled his promises. That's the major reason he revoked uh, revoked Article 370 and 35A from the from the constitutions and made it a part of India, like any other territory of India. I'm talking about Kashmir. So in that context, the way they are looking into Kashmiris, they are not looking them as Muslim communities over there who are demanding separation from them or who wants to seek, you know, their own independence from from India altogether. They are just treating them any X, Y, Z who is happening to be there. And and you probably would have heard about that uh, Prime Minister Modi is going to pay a visit to Kashmir, to Srinagar on the 7th of March. And there he's going to showcase his power and tell the world, look, if I re revoke, revoke the constitution and script off um, 370 and 35A of the constitution, there was a reason to that because he is now telling that before even being there, like it's not 7th March at the moment, just going to be 4th March now. And he is telling the world that, look, I am there and, and, and around 100,000 people are, are going to be gathered over there. So he al already knows the numbers, how many people is going to be there, because probably he's going to shift those people over there to, to, to make it a successful event for him and to tell the people his own. I'm not talking about the Kashmiris here. I'm not talking about the people in Srinagar, but overall in India that see, I proved my words that I will make Kashmir a part of India. And this is what legally I have done. Now you have to play your role by taking properties over there, by moving to this part of the world. And then you have to make it a part of India as like any other territory of India. So I think that he is doing in his best interest. But what we can do as Muslim Umar to protect, promote the rights of Kashmiris, I think we need to think about how to protect them from the Hindutva ideology, how to protect them from Modi, who is going to be potentially going to be re-elected in the upcoming elections. So we right, have Dr. to be... Farah, Dr. Farah, you know, when you look at... Uh, uh, 
what is stemming as far as the Muslims of India is concerned and the Muslims of an illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir. It also goes much beyond that. It also goes within the Hindu community as well. And there is a social hierarchy that is at play, despite the fact that in 1951, the low caste system was abolished from the Indian law system, but there still is, the, is that uh, caste system that demarcates between the high caste Hindus like the Shudas and the uh, uh, Dalits. Uh, do you feel that uh, this caste system will continue to manifest itself uh, for the favor of all these uh, high caste Hindus in the years to come as well? And of course, uh, propagated by uh, this Hindu or Hindutva ideology of Narendra Modi. I think this caste system is in the best interest of Modi for now and Hindutva in general, because all these Brahmins who were considered back in time uh, the supreme caste and they were the better privileged people in India. So at the moment, those are the people uh, prevailing into the Hindutva and, and running the system of Indian democracy over there, which is mm -hmm. labeled as democracy, but unfortunately is not a democracy at all. So it suits the Indian system, this hierarchical division suits them because they want to rule. They want to control the mob. They want to control their own people. Now, speaking about the division within the hierarchy, how the division is going to go about, whether the people are happy with it or they are very unhappy, there is no second thought. People are not happy about it. I've heard from the Christians over there who are now overseas and I've been listening to their stories and they are telling that we are ready to seek asylum in other countries because they got education overseas, they, they got experience and exposure. And um, on top of that, they know what it means to be a human being in another country rather than in India. So they know the true meaning of what you can be and what are your due share in, 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 in rights in a democratic country, what you want to be. So they don't want to go back to India. They just want to stand against Modi. They're not happy with the system altogether. And speaking about Dalits and all, the way they have been mistreated, I think nobody can accept it. Even all those human rights entities who defend and, and, and demand human rights to be to be, you know, to protect it over there, they will say that, yes, whatever is happening to them, it's not in the best interest. The Christian Solidarity Reports uh, from the UK, they highlight that the way uh, the, the marginalized communities are treated, the way the minorities are treated in India is not the right interpretation of how uh, in democracy the, the people have to be dealt with. But still, what is happening? Is there any outcome? Is there any solution? Is there any pressure on Modi government that you have to deal with everyone the right way? No, unfortunately. Nobody wants to, to push Modi and to tell him that you need to behave and you need to give every human being irrespective of if it's Hindu, if it's Christian, if it's Muslim, if it's following another ideology or beliefs or in even the Dalits, you have to treat them the same way as you will treat your own Hindutva followers. So unfortunately, it's just a small segment ruling the entire country. It's, it's like, you know, the way like a, a country which is hijacked by a a few people and then they are ruling it the way they feel better with that so unfortunately mm -hmm. this so, it, dr farad it's so unfortunate it's so unfortunate you know that uh, that all these incidents are happening where, you know, within uh, uh, the limits of uh, uh, a country that calls itself uh, the world's largest democracy and pluralistic country and so on and so forth and has the backing of the west and i feel and i'm sure you'd agree with me that until and unless the west does not put a stop to, uh, to India and pressurize India to stop all such activities, whether it be denying the right to self-determination to Muslims of the Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir or uh, continuing the, uh, the rapes of women, Indians, locals or foreigners or uh, denying the minorities their due rights. India will continue to be a country that will uh, slowly and steadily uh, disintegrate into different parts because these all people, apart from those of an illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir, are part of India itself. Thank you very much, Dr. Farah, to have joined us, to have talked to us about this very important issue, and that uh, is uh, that of uh, rape, that is that of denial of rights to minorities 
in India. Let us come to our second story and that concerns day 150 of the conflict of the war between Israel and Palestine. A lot has happened. Uh, the casualties continue to increase. They have passed uh, 30,000. The number of uh, the number of injured have passed uh, 70,000. Children continue to be, uh, you know, subjugated uh, to violence as well. They continue to also be subjugated to inhumane conditions in hospitals where the necessary uh, uh, tools are not available to treat them. So on the one hand, we have children who ha are forced to be amputated because the, the necessary surgeries are uh, not available or the tools are not available to treat them. On the other hand, you don't have the medicine or even the anesthetics to uh, perform surgeries in a normal manner. This and so much more is happening that uh, it kind of, uh, you know, dissuades uh, uh, humanity or the, those people who are trying to do some good for mankind to move forward, especially when it comes to Palestine, the way the West is reacting. We've been joined by Noor Ode. She's a political analyst and she joins us from the West Bank. Noor, thank you very much to have joined us. I know it's very late in the evening, but nevertheless, thank you so much to have joined us or uh, to talk about this very important topic. I'll begin with U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris, who has bluntly called on Israel on Sunday for not doing enough to seize a humanitarian catastrophe in Gaza. Why sh stop short of calling for a permanent end to Israel's assault, just restrict yourself to ceasefire? It's an important question. And, uh, you know, even the statement from the American vice president, um, you know, should be taken in the, in the wider context with the fact, remembering the fact that the United States is still providing uh, Israel with the weapons and the political cover necessary to continue this war. So it's, um, you know, a bit disingenuous to speak about this man-made disaster, about this engineered starvation of Palestinians in Gaza, when the U.S. knows very well that it holds the key to halting this war, and yet it continues to support this war while, you know, urging Israel to take measures to alleviate some of the suffering. A very ironic uh, position that is really inconsistent, and it's not even convincing to the American public, which by majority wants to see a ceasefire. You know, speaking of ceasefire, I again refer to what mm -hmm. Kamala Harris said. She says people in Gaza are starving. This is a, a, a reality that we all know. Uh, yeah. She says the conditions are inhumane. Our common humanity compel us to act. What's stopping mm -hmm. them from acting? What's stopping them from stopping, uh, you know, military uh, assistance to Israel and putting pressure on them to stop the inhumane acts in uh, Palestine? Nothing. Nothing is stopping them except Biden's own ideological alignment with Israel and the fact that according to many U.S. reports, he lacks basic empathy towards Palestinians. And he's convinced that he needs to support Israel no matter what it does mm. and no matter how the American public feels about it. Um, <clears throat> about 70 percent of all Americans, regardless of political affili affiliation, want to see this war stop. And yet he continues to find the funding. He continues to send billions of dollars worth of military assistance to Israel, without which Israel cannot continue uh, this war. They ran out of bullets. They ran out of art artillery shells. And the United States opened the warehouses for them, which they have in the region. That's how involved this American administration is in this war. And that's why, like I said, the statements coming out of Kamala Harris, even though they're welcomed and they're <clears throat> perhaps a rhetorical shift, um, we haven't seen actions to match those kinds of expressed sentiments. The Americans can, if they wanted to, stop this war today. Do you feel that statements such as these or that by Anthony Blinken, in which he says Washington is trying to get more humanitarian assistance into Gaza through every available channel, we know that they airdropped uh, some aid into Gaza. Uh, but the health ministry in Gaza also says Israeli forces again opened fire on people in Rafah, mm -hmm. killing at least two dozen people. Which brings me back to these statements by Kamala Harris or Anthony Blinken. Are these statements mere politicking or is there any form of sincerity behind it in your point of view? Well, in my opinion, it's just politicking. Uh, but the Biden administration is getting a beating at the polls uh, in the Democratic primaries. And we have to remember in November, 
there is presidential elections in the U.S. The Democratic Party does not agree with Biden on his policy in Gaza. So he needs, as a matter of expediency, as a matter of, you know, political survival, he needs to bring back some of those angry Democrats. And so far, he's been unwilling to do it by action. So he's resorting to the next big big thing, which is statements and a, and a, a little bit of political stunts, to be honest with you. Airdropping food is the last resort. Uh, it does not make sense for the Americans to be airdropping food because their ally, the country that depends on them politically and militarily, is not allowing the food to be delivered by uh, by road, by, by land. At the end of the day, that airdropping of, of assistance is coordinated with Israel as well. So it really makes very little sense. Um, and, 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 you know, the expectation that people would welcome this as some sort of breakthrough is, is um, mind-boggling. The amount of aid that can be dropped uh, by air compared to what can be delivered by land is minuscule. It doesn't meet the bare minimum requirements that are now in Gaza. 50 children have died just in the past few days because of starvation. You don't solve that by dropping food and hoping that you don't miss because some of those some of those cargo uh, uh, shipments were dropped in the sea. All right, Noor, I'd also like to understand your point of view as far as this uh, mediation process that is going on between mm -hmm. Cairo, uh, you know, between Egypt, Qatar and the U.S., uh, in which uh, Palestine is also uh, uh, indirectly taking part. Israel has not sent any contingent to it uh, for whichever reasons uh, which they better understand. Uh, a lot of Israeli newspapers are saying that Israel has boycotted uh, these talks. What happens now then this to this deal? Well, we, we understand that Qatar and Egypt continue to work and continue to reach out to the Israelis through the Americans as well to reach a deal. Everybody, except Netanyahu perhaps, is interested in having a ceasefire that would, as the proposal states, last six months, uh, six weeks, sorry, so through the month of Ramadan, where more assistance would be brought into the into the Gaza Strip, where more food would arrive, more medicine, and where people would be allowed incrementally back to northern Gaza, which is a very, very important point that uh, that the public in Gaza needs to have delivered. So I think we will continue to see those efforts. They will continue until the very last minute. And in the meantime, we're going to have we're going to have a lot of grandstanding from all sides, especially from Israel, especially from Netanyahu, whose right-wing government is opposed to any deal. They will make it very difficult. They will have last-minute requests and last-minute demands, as we've seen, um, uh, that may, you know, threaten uh, the talks. But I think we, you know, many people are quite grateful that there are responsible actors uh, doing this mediation who are not allow allowing these petty politics uh, calculations to trample uh, the efforts to reach a ceasefire. It is needed now more than uh, it's been needed uh, ever before. And the hope is that through those six weeks, uh, uh, a bigger deal, a deal for a permanent ceasefire, an end to this genocidal war, a, a complete withdrawal of Israeli troops from Gaza would materialize um, and end this war once and for all. But those six weeks would be critical. All right. All in in all of this talk of six weeks of uh, a cessation of hostilities, there is also talk of de denial or uh, you know restriction of uh, health facilities uh, to the children, to the women, to the men. Yeah. Uh, medical sources also uh, uh, talk about, as you said, the number of children who are dying of malnutrition, of dehydration. Uh, UNICEF has warned that many children in Gaza will die of dehydration and malnutrition unless there is direct intervention. This is what you've been talking about. The head Absolutely. of Amnesty International also says that the death of children succumbing to dehydration and malnutrition is a result of Israeli atrocities that have engineered this famine, also yeah. something that you have talked about. The health ministry also says it has detected about one million cases of infectious diseases which do not have the necessary facilities to be treated. They also say Israel has killed 364 health personnel, arrested 269, including hospital directors, 
since they began uh, these atrocities on the 7th of October last year and have destroyed 155 health institutions, 32 hospitals and 53 health centers have been put out of services, 126 ambulances have been targeted. Doesn't this uh, uh, you know, form part of what we call genocide, war crimes? Absolutely, absolutely. Each one of those is a, a, a grave violation in of itself. Using food as a weapon of war, starving people intentionally, as Israel has done, is a war crime. Uh, punishing the entire population is a war crime. Uh, and, 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 and let me, you know, just remind the viewers, when you starve a population, when you cause malnutrition on such a massive scale, this is not resolved by simply dropping food or bringing in aid. This is a long-term health crisis that will impact these children. They will have health uh, uh, complications throughout their childhood. This affects their cognitive abilities, their growth, their immune system, and much, much more. So we're talking about a crime that will have effects that last much longer than the duration of the crime itself. And even if we had a ceasefire tomorrow, thousands of people will die as UN agencies and health experts uh, uh, expect and forewarn because their immune system has been compromised so much, because they're too far gone to be saved. That's if we have the ceasefire tomorrow. And if we don't, tens of thousands of people are at risk of dying of diseases that wouldn't have even affected that many people had the war not broken out. We're seeing a, you know, a, a, a lot of spread of hepatitis A, we were seeing chicken pox. We're seeing people die because there isn't enough insulin. They can't get their hands on insulin to save their life or on antibiotics in the north. That's how severe the situation is. So a ceasefire will give them a chance, but that doesn't mean that all of them will be saved, unfortunately. No, I'd also like to understand the bias that exists in the Western media as far as you know, mm -hmm. reporting the truth uh, of what is happening in Gaza is concerned. There was an article that came in December 2023 in one of the leading publications in uh, uh, the US that talked about Hamas's agenda to weaponize rape and sexual assault <laughs> on the 7th of October. We, all these claims have been unsubstantiated, uh, which also demonstrate that media outlets pro-Israeli anti-Palestinian bias. But this is not the only example of the bias that exists. In your point of view, will there ever be a reversal of such a policy? I think we can take heart in the fact that this time, even though we've seen, to be honest with you, devastating examples of dehumanization of Palestinians, of bias, of outright incitement against Palestinians in Western media, but we've also seen a lot of pushback. And that has caused a lot of uh, agencies and newspapers and news organizations to check themselves and to do better, at least in some cases. The New York Times, unfortunately, has done quite a few outrageous uh, uh, reports that were commissioned by people who are not even journalists. And in one case, the report that you talked about, the person who filed that story is a former Israeli uh, officer in the army, someone with connections to the intelligence, someone who is not a reporter, and someone whose fact-checking abilities have been, uh, you know, uh, put into question, and, and she's been fired. Um, and I think one of the unfortunate side effects about this dehumanization of Palestinians, um, the acceptance of Israeli claims without any question, is the fact that a lot of the truth is lost. So even when it comes to the allegation of weaponizing uh, rape and, and, and raping women on 7th of October by Palestinian fighters, you know, Palestinians, not just Israelis, want to see an independent investigation that comes out with the truth. It is in everybody's interest that that issue is cleared up. And the, and the waters have been muddied because of all of those you know, all of that misinformation, all of that deliberate uh, incitement against Palestinians that thinks about the short-term gain of making people hate Palestinians to the point where they would excuse their extermination. Of course, we saw that in other 
cases of genocide. But I think in 2024, people, you know, many of us had hoped that this wouldn't happen. It has, unfortunately. But again, I take hope in the fact that a lot of these organizations have received pushback. There have been protests from within the organizations and from without. And many of them have, ha have had to walk back a lot of uh, uh, the misreporting and the lack of professionalism, to be honest with you, and the outright bias that they've had. Uh, and we've seen some good reports as well coming out to kind of offset that balance, but there's still a long way to go before we can you know, treat the root causes of that racism and that bias and that Islamophobia. This racism, this bias, this Islamophobia is also what led to the killing of more than 117 people who were uh, waiting for food in, uh, in Gaza, in Al Rashid yeah. Street. Uh, and more, around 700 have been injured. Israel is concocting uh, all kinds of excuses on why they, you know, they started to kill uh, the Palestinians, mm -hmm. uh, which, of course, Amnesty International and other organizations have said are based on falsehood. Will Israel ever be held accountable for this and other heinous crimes against humanity? I believe so. And on that incident in particular, I thought it was very interesting that um, there were reports that came out proving that the Israeli army had had released doctored video to kind of push their false narrative um, and distance themselves from that massacre. Um, look, I, I think we've seen a lot of significant steps of accountability in the past month or so, even though we haven't seen results yet when it comes to the genocide case against Israel, when it comes to assessing the legality of occupation in which Pakistan uh, participated just uh, you know a week or, or 10 days ago uh, at The Hague as well. And now there's a case against Germany for complicity in genocide uh, also at the International Court of Justice. I think that you know something has shifted and there is um, an avalanche, if you will, of groups and, and individuals and citizens and, and politicians even all around the world who are un, you know, unable to look away from what is happening in Palestine and unwilling to excuse it, unwilling to give Israel a free pass. And that's why we're seeing cases, not just at The Hague, but even in capitals, that want to put an end to arms trade with Israel, that wants to put an end to uh, giving a free pass to Israeli settlers. We're seeing now movement about outlawing the sale of Israeli settlement housing um, in uh, foreign capitals around the world. These are significant steps because so far Israel has felt like it could do anything. It can commit any crime against Palestinians and it would never pay for it. And right now there is a real prospect for, for Israel's occupation and crimes to have financial, political, and military implications. And I think that will be key in ending that impunity and in ending the occupation itself, which is the source, the root cause, really, of all of those atrocities. But the pressure needs to be kept up. And I think Muslim countries or majority Muslim countries can play a very important role in that, not just by pressuring Israel and severing uh, um, um, military or, or, or trade ties with it, if they have any, but also with, with Israel's allies. They need to understand that if they're complicit in genocide, their businesses won't be welcome in majority Muslim, Muslim countries. Their you know, a, a prospect of economic cooperation with Muslim uh, countries would not uh, be as bright and would not be as promising. That kind of cost uh, will bring pressure to bear on Israel and on its enablers. Well, the next couple of days are going to be extremely important, Nurel. Let's hope some kind of positivity comes out of the talks in Cairo. And uh, there is, uh, in fact, before the beginning of the holy month of Ramadan, a cessation of hostilities, at least for a time period, in which they can maybe discuss how to move along on a permanent cessation, on a permanent ceasefire, and then move towards the two-state solution or any solution that would be benefiting the people of Palestine, whose land has been occupied by the Zionist Israeli regime. Thank you very much, Nuruda, to have joined us all the way from the West Bank and to have given us your very eminent point of view that we hold very dear. Thank you very much. Let's come to our last three stories. The first concerns South Korea, where doctors have been rallying as the healthcare standoff continues to escalate. Thousands of doctors in South Korea protested yesterday in Seoul as an escalating standoff 
on uh, medical training reforms continued, which has seen junior doctors quit on uh, mass also plunging hospitals in, into chaos. Now, under South Korean law, doctors are restricted from striking, and the government this week requested police investigate people connected to this uh, stoppage. I don't know which kind of uh, agreements uh, will be put into place as far as the doctors are concerned or as far as the government is concerned. But uh, it is uh, being said that a lot of licenses of these junior doctors might be cancelled if they continue uh, with these protests. Uh, we hope for a cessation of uh, these protests and some good to come out of these. Next, let's come to obesity. Today is the World Obesity Day, ladies and gentlemen, and it is being uh, observed all across the world, not only to understand the reasons for obesity, but also to, uh, uh, to you know, uh, ascertain how to move forward as a nation that could become healthy as a youth that could become healthy and this is what this year's message is uh, the for the youth to become more responsible as far as obesity is concerned there are so many uh, important uh, messages around obesity whether it be the causes of obesity whether what obesity causes psychologically physically uh, to a society to people and families and it is extremely important in this day and age also for societies to understand what exactly is obesity how we can control it and the role of certain products whether sugar related or others that you know kind of uh, escalate the the propagation of obesity in the youth so this is what we need to do in order uh, to understand obesity better in order to curtail obesity to the maximum finally artificial glaciers ladies and gentlemen have uh, uh, helped stave off a uh, drought in kyrgyzstan of all uh, places now in the tianchan mountains villagers have made an artificial glacier to provide water for their droughted farms this is harnessing nature and this is uh, counteracting a uh, climate change because there was an issue with the drought this is what they did they created an artificial glacier and this will uh, when it melts down will provide water to all those villages who have been uh, restricted from the uh, water supply it's an interesting example an example many other countries uh, could follow as well climate change is unfortunately a reality that the world needs to come to terms with and do the needful in order uh, to uh, stop it before it's way too late with that ladies and gentlemen we come to an end of today's news we'll see you inshallah tomorrow when new story segments are pertain to you us in Pakistan. Stay safe. Allah Hafiz.